Welcome to the lecture for chapter 23. This is our second lecture on electricity, and in this lecture we're going to talk about electricity that moves rather than the just charge that stays in place. And that, of course, is electric current. All right? So we'll talk about the flow of charge, how to quantify it, it's the amp, what is the electric current, We'll talk about how we make current flow, which is a voltage source. Essentially, it's like a current elevator and then fl current flows downhill, so to speak. We'll talk about electrical resistance, which is a choke point in the flow of current. Ohm's law, which relates the voltage source, that elevator, to the choke points and the overall flow. All right, we'll use lots of good uh, water analogies to kind of think about it because our voltage source out is kind of like a pump. Um, we'll talk about direct and alternating currents. That's AC and DC. What's the difference? How do we, you know, what do we need to know about that? We'll then actually talk about something that is a little bit different than current, which is the actual speed of electrons as they bounce around inside a wire, for example. We'll talk about how you can take electrical current and a voltage and create power. And then we'll talk about some specific applications of currents, CFLs, LEDs, and then finish off on electrical circuits, some uh, types of a simple electrical circuits. Okay, so the flow of charge. Well, on the ends of an electrical conductor, remember conductors are just a, a medium through which um, free electrons can easily move, are at different electrical potentials, then there's a potential difference. And remember, we talked about the potential difference before. It was the volt, and it had units of joules per coulomb. Okay? So, char so energy, which is the joule, per charge, and the coulomb is a unit of charge. All right? So when you have that potential difference, charge flows from one end to another. It is analogous to water flowing from high pressure to low pressure. Because here, you know, the, the higher pressure section is going to continue to flow until both sides of our U-shaped um, tube here are going to be at equal levels. Okay? So if you want to have a sustained flow, you wouldn't just have a, you know, one and done, unequal levels of a U-shaped tube and then have it reach equilibrium. Instead, you need a pump because that way you can create, you can keep the high pressure zone and thus keep the water flowing the whole time right, like a fountain. So to uh, attain a sustained flow of charge in the conductor, some arrangement must be provided to maintain a difference in the potential, all right, while the charge flows from one into another. A continuous flow is possible if the difference in the water levels, hence the difference in the water pressures, is maintained with the use of a pump. So we need an electric pump, all right? Well, electric current, while well, we're talking, we talk about in Metal wires, a conducting electrons are the charge carriers that are free to move. The protons are bound within the nuclei. In fluids, positive ions and electrons constitute electrical charge flow. All right, so you can have, you, you could definitely have positive charge carriers in the case of a fluid, like maybe like a microfluidic device that's used for, you know, some sort of uh, mimicry of a circuit. So, which of these statements is true? Electrical current is a flow of electrical charge. Electrical current is stored in batteries. Or are they both true? Well, only the first one, because you can't store current. Current is the movement of charge. There's no, there's no storing movement, just like you can't store velocity, okay? So, the rate of electric flow, it is measured in what's called the ampere. The ampere is the coulomb per second, okay? So it is the coulomb per second, that is the amp. So, so far our new units, our units of electricity, have been the coulomb, which is the unit of charge, now the amp, the ampere, also called the amp, and then of course we also know that the volt, which is really our third unit of charge we've seen so far, is the energy in joules divided by the charge in coulombs. All right, it's great that charge in coulombs starts the same letter, isn't it? So the speed of electrons, which is called the drift speed through a wire is slow because of the continuous bumping of the electrons in the wire. So the actual ampere rate and the speed of electrons are totally different quantities, okay? They're not the same thing. The charge flows through a circuit. The voltage is established across a circuit. So those are, those are key words that come up, okay? So current flows through it. Charge is across it, all right? Say, so, excuse me. Charge flows through the circuit. Voltage is across it, okay? So there's a voltage difference because it's a potential energy difference, potential energy divided by charge, all right? That's across the whole circuit. But the actual flow within it and through it is the charge, okay? So what's the difference between um, alter, well, what is alternating current? We'll get to the difference in a minute. So alternating current is when electrons oscillate to and fro around fixed positions. So they're, they're actually act, acting kind of like a mass attached to a spring, like sloshing back and forth. The movement is produced by a generator or an alternator that switches the sign of the charge periodically. So it's either pulling or pushing the electrons, hence the sloshing back and forth. 
Commercial AC circuits are used in most residential circuits throughout the world and can be stepped up to higher voltages for transmission over greater distances with small heat losses or stepped down where energy is consumed. Okay, so one of the big advantages of AC alternating current is its ability to be stepped up or stepped down using a transformer. That is a inductive process. We'll talk about electromagnetic induction in, the greater, in a later chapter. So as far as voltage sources, a conductor is any material having free charged particles that, are, that easily flow through it when electrical force acts on them. We've talked about this before. Think free electrons. All right. Uh, the electrical potential difference is the difference in potential between two points. This is again a review from the last, last chapter. Charges in the conductor flow from higher potential to lower potential. Potential. The flow of charge persists until both ends of the conductor reach the same potential. And if you prevent them from reaching the same potential with a pump, then they'll continue to flow. All right. So we just need that pumping device. Okay. So electrical potential difference. Right. So again, the idea here. So how do we how do we create a pumping device? Well, electrical potential difference can be um, sustained with a steady flow when there is a battery or a generator. And what it does is the battery or generator does work in pulling negative charges apart from positive ones. So it's continue, continually creating that, that difference. In the case of a battery, there's a chemical process, so chemical potential energy is being released to do actual um, electromagnetic work to pull charges apart. And then as those charges get pulled apart, then they're allowed to flow through the circuit. So the electrical potential difference, the volts, because remember, electrical potential difference and volts are interchangeable terms. One is obviously much shorter, right? But the full name is electrical potential difference. All right, in chemical batteries, the work by the chemical disintegration of zinc or lead in the acid that allows for the um, charge to get pulled apart. All right, so what is electrical resistance, right? We've seen in a couple of our circuits so far, right? There's the resistor, right? And we see the, anal the analogy in water is like a, sort of like a hose that is kind of kinked. Maybe there's a lot of tight flow points kind of forcing, forcing the water to go around all these tight turns, right? Because what, what would that happen, right? Well, if you did that, if you force the water to go around tight kinks in the hose, you'd hear it, okay? That means that some of the energy is getting changed to sound energy, and potentially the hose would warm up a little bit because you're forcing the water to bump against the sides a lot. So you'd be turning some of that um, kinetic energy of the water into heat and sound energy. Same idea with the resistor. The resistor changes the form of the electrical energy into heat. All right, so current in the circuit depends on the voltage and the electrical resistance in ohms. All circuits have resistance because all wires have, resist to have resistance unless, I guess, they're, they're perfect um, superconductors. The resistor is the circuit element that regulates the current inside an electrical device. Because sometimes you want there to be some lost energy because that allows for particular types of circuits to be, to be built. This is what resistors look like in terms of actual building circuits at home. The symbol for them is this. It kind of looks like a lightning bolt with two ends sticking out. All right? So the factors affecting electrical resistance, well, it's inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. So if you're, if you're considering the inherent resistance of a wire, thin wires um, have more resistance than thick wires. So the thinner the wire, the more resistance, because there's more opportunity then for the electrons to bump into the sides. You can think of it as a surface to volume ratio, because you get smaller and smaller, you have a greater ratio of surface area to volume. Thus, there's more and more opportunities for, again, those electrons to bump with the surface and lose their energy to the outside world. All right? Also, electrical resistance is directly proportional to length. So the more length, the more resistance. The longer the wire, the more resistance. Again, more opportunities for the electrons to lose their, lose their energy. All right, also material. Rubber has very high resistance. It is a conductor. So conduct, um, excuse me, is an insulator. So insulators have very high resistance, okay? Conductors can have quite low resistance, okay? Also temperature. The higher the temperature, the more resistance. Because as the metal heats up, the actual, um, nuclei that are left behind as all, that all the electrons are rushing past if they're if they're bouncing back and forth they're going to then be in the path of electrons more frequently and they're going to cause more collisions between the fixed place nuclei and the moving electrons and then those collisions happen that energy is then imparted to the vibration of the solid and then some of that is, is lost as heat all right so semiconductors refer to materials we discussed them before refer to materials that can alternate between being a conductor and an insulator um, germanium and silicon are key types of semiconductors. Superconductors, as we said before, are materials with zero electrical resistance to the flow of charge. So they, they could just have those electrons flow and have no energy loss to heat. High temperature superconductors refer to ceramic materials that can carry much current at a low voltage. All right, so now on to Ohm's law. What is Ohm's law? Well, Ohm's law in equation form is V equals IR. I think it's good to start start with the, the equation here, all right? Is relationship between the voltage, the current, and the resistance. V for voltage, 
I for current, which we haven't shown the letter for before, we know that the units are going to be volts for voltage, which is great because the unit is the same as the, as the, you know, the letter for the unit is the same as the letter for the variable. We don't see that very often. The units for the current is the amp, uppercase A, and then the units for resistance is the ohm, just like the ohm's law, and ohm, rather than using the letter O, which wouldn't work, instead we use omega. Okay, so we use the letter omega to represent the ohm. Okay, but what this law tells us is there's a relationship between voltage in volts, current in amps, and resistance in ohms. All right, it states that the current in a circuit varies in direct proportion, proportion to the difference or voltage and inversely proportional with the resistance. All right, so you see that? Because look, I is directly proportional to V, right? So V goes up, so must I. But if R goes up, then I has to go down if the voltage is kept constant. So that's the inverse relationship between current and resistance. Okay, here, here it is written out in words, and specifically this is solved for current. So we just took the equation that I wrote before and just solved for I by dividing both sides by R. So we get that current is V over I, V over R, all right? So for a constant resistance, current will be twice as much for twice the voltage. For twice the resistance and twice the voltage, the current will be, current will be unchanged, all right? So resistors are those circuit elements that regulate current inside the electrical devices, all right? And so that when, you, when you're gonna be using those, when you're gonna be considering Ohm's law. So when you double the voltage in a simple electric, electric circuit, you double the, all right? So what do you, what do you change, all right? You double the current, okay? So if you double the voltage, you double the current, all right? This is, this, this is a straightforward application of Ohm's law, okay? So electric shock, all right? Well, damaging effects of shock result from current passing through the body. The electrical potential difference between one part of your body and the other is actually quite high. You have very high resistance. Right? It, can, it can be as low as 100 ohms in extreme cases, but it's more likely going to be on the order of hundreds of thousands of ohms is the, in your resistance in your body. All right. So now the difference between direct and alternating current. Well, direct current, we haven't talked about, that, that's, that comes from batteries. That is flow in one direction, so no sloshing back and forth. The electrons always move in one direction from positive to negative. Okay? That all batteries, that, that, elect, that chemical um, process that is separating the charge and acting as the voltage pump, all batteries are direct current just one direction, but all plugs in the wall are alternating current. The electrons in the circuit are moved first in one direction and then in the other direction. And the rate at which the, 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 um, the current is moved in one direction and in the other direction in alternating um, currents in your wall is 60 hertz. So it's happening 60 times per second, which means that the period right here, the period of the oscillation is 1 60th of a second, okay? which means it's very fast and the effects of it aren't perceived. So for example, there's a time where the current is gonna hit zero. It hits zero twice per period. That means that, um, that two that, that's happening, so you have um, basically 120 times per second, the voltage is zero. That actually causes things like lights to flicker at that rate, okay? Because there's, there's, there's a point that's happening every you know, 120 times per second where there is no voltage, thus there is no power output. Okay, but we don't see that flicker because we can't perceive something that is flickering that flickering that fast. Hence, the choice of 60 hertz or part of the choice of 60 hertz. Okay, so you don't notice that your lights are flickering, but they actually are. Okay, um, basically the perceived um, the perception of flickering is going to at its very upper limit is about 30 times per second. So anything that flickers more than 30 times per second seems to be steady to the human eye. All right, so commercial electricity in North America alternating um, alternating um, current. 60 hertz per second, the voltage is 120, all right? Power trans transmission is more efficient at higher voltages. Europe uses 220, but um, US continues to use 120 because the equipment is already installed, all right? If you wanna convert from AC to DC, that's where you need a, uh, a basically a, um, a rectifier to change your, um, your current from one, one type to another, all right? Um, and you can also have, you, you can have a transformer to change the voltage, but at the very least, if you want to change it from, so you can have a transformer um, rectifier, or you can just have a rectifier if you want to keep the voltage the same, all right, if you want to keep it at 120. And most devices don't take 120 that need DC, think like a computer, so they're going to have both a transformer and a rectifier. What the rectifier is doing is it's changing your AC current into DC, and it does it like this, all right? So when, the in, you, when you put it into a diode, which only allows for flow in one direction, you only get half, because that's what the diode is like a one-way switch. So now it's only allowing for half the flow. But here's the thing, right? When you have half the flow like this, that means you'd have a lot of periods with no current. So you'd have a lot of very pronounced flickering because there would be prolonged periods of no power. That also isn't great for devices to just have no power periodically. 
So instead, you put in a um, capacitor to smooth it out because the capacitor will charge and discharge and it, it, won't, it won't charge and discharge instantaneously. And so now you've turned your, um, your, you know, your alternating current into a one directional current with the diode and then you are then having it um, slowly discharge and charge with the capacitor. And now you have yourself a, you know, and because then you can kind of, then you can change the rate and you can have a fairly direct current. Is it perfect? No, right? And that pair of diodes is what gets, what gets it done here, okay? All right, so when we flip the light switch on a wall and the, um, and the circuit, an electrical field is established inside the conductor. The establishment of the electric field moves at the speed of light, okay? But the electrons don't. The electrons continue their random motion while simultaneously being nudged by the electric field. Okay, so the electric field is going to make them go in one direction. The electrons are actually moving in the opposite direction of the field. Remember, electric fields point this way, and electrons move in the opposite direction because the electric field is established for the direction that a, a positive charge would experience a force. So it's always important to remember that the field and the actual electron motion are opposite each other. Okay? The current is established through the wires at nearly the speed of light, but the electrons don't move anywhere close to that speed. The electrons bump around, bump into each other, and they move at just centimeters per second. Okay? So the voltage source is DC. If the voltage source is DC like the battery, the electric field lines are maintained in one direction in the conductor. The, um, the, conduction, the conducting electrons are accelerated by the field in the direction parallel to the field lines, but opposite, direct, opposite, right? along the field lines, but opposite direction. Before they gain appreciable speed, they bump into um, other anchored metallic ions in the path, and that transforms some of their kinetic energy into heat. All right? So mis misconceptions, common misconceptions about electric current. Current is the propagation through the conducting wire by electrons bumping into one another. It is not true that, ele that the electrons that are free to move in a conducting wire are accelerated by the electric field impressed upon them. All right? It is true that they do bump into one another and other atoms, but this slows them down and offers resistance to the motion. The electrons throughout the entire closed path of the circuit all react simultaneously, right? So there's no like chain reaction or one bumps in the, in the one and the next one bumps into the other, right? So it's not, it's not like a, a, it's not literally like a domino effect of, of electrons bumping into each other. Instead, they all simultaneously start to move as they experience electric, the electric field. And the electric field for any small scale operation is instantaneous because it's moving at the speed of light. The electric field is moving at three, you know, 300 million meters per second. And so it, you know, it gets established instantaneously and all those electrons experience it, all right? Electrical outlets, another misconception, in the walls of the homes are the source of the electrons. No, the electrons don't come out of the wall. They're already in the material, okay? So what about electric power? What well, is the rate at which electricity energy is converted in some other form? Heat, uh, mechanical power, you know, like lifting something, all right? And power in now, you know, we know, we know that power is energy per time, Right? That is always the definition of power, which is um, represented as watts and is also joules per second. But here, we can, there's actually a, new, a brand new way of expressing power that's specific to, to circuits, really specific to, um, the, to current flow, and it's current times voltage. All right? So we have that power is actually I times V, which is a great, a great formula because it ties in really nicely with Ohm's law. Okay? So incandescent bulbs dissipate most of their energy in the form of heat, not light. So they are not very energy efficient unless you're trying to use them to warm something up, which you're not. You're using, using them to actually produce visible light. Fluorescent lamps, on the other hand, emit much less heat, which is why you can touch them without burning yourself. So they're more efficient in turning the energy into visible light. LEDs are more efficient still. All right. So here's an example of a compact C CFL. And we you know, really you know, replaced incandescent light bulbs, but of course now are being replaced by LEDs, right? So we've, we've moved on from one technology to another in rather rapid succession, right? Considering that these slides are only a few years old. Um, right, here are LEDs. Another light source, even more long lasting is the LED. Um, the most primitive being the, um, the little red lights that tell you whether your stereo is on or off, all right? Um, but now they've gotten much brighter, much more efficient, and are able to replicate um, light bulbs in your home and, have, and can produce light um, at um, basically um, in terms of like, so if you look at LEDs, often they'll have a temperature on them, but you might be like, wait, but the LED isn't hot to the touch. Why does it have a temperature? Well, that temperature is corresponding to, the, to Wien's law, which is a temperature that corresponds color to temperature. And the idea is the ones that have a temperature of say like 5,600 um, um, Kelvin, that means that they have a temperature in terms of black body radiation and Wien's law, which is equivalent to the surface of the sun. And it's not because they literally have a temperature equal to the surface of the sun, but it's because they're producing light just like the sun. So they're producing sunlight spectrum rainbow light. And that, that you know, can create a, you know, a, certain, a certain effect because it makes, it makes the light feel potentially more natural. 
Okay, so our final comment here about circuits. So any path along which electrons can flow from the negative terminal to the positive terminal is considered a circuit. The, um, a complete circuit allows the continuous flow. So if you have an open switch like this, that's a broken cir circuit or an incomplete circuit. All right, so circuits are connected in two common ways, series and parallel. All right, series is a single pathway, parallel has junctions. Okay, so if there are any junctions, if there's any splits in your circuit, then that has to be a parallel circuit. Series circuits are when there's just one continuous line. Okay, so here is, here is an example of a series circuit. So is this one. All right, and in the series circuit, the electrical current through a single um, pathway. Um, in, that, in this case, the total resistance to the current is the sum of all the individual resistances because you're just experiencing each one, um, one after another. And the current is equal to the voltage supplied by the source divided by the total resistance. Okay. On the other hand, parallel is quite a bit different. Okay. Oh, more about series. Um, the total voltage um, impressed across a series circuit divides among the individual electrical devices in a circuit. So the sum of the voltage drops across the resistance of each individual device is equal to the total voltage supplied by the source. So what I'm saying here is that the difference in voltage here plus the difference in voltage across that bulb, plus the difference in voltage there, must be equal to the original voltage from the battery. Because we get back to zero voltage, because we get back to where we started. Think again about the water analogy. This is back to the original elevation, and then we're going to pump it up to a higher one with the battery, and then we're going to flow back down to where we started. Okay? So that's, that's the idea about the sum of voltages. The voltage drop across each device um, are proportional to its resistance. That's just based on Ohm's law, because V just equals IR. All right, and it's the same current in through the whole series circuit, so they, they all have the same I. And if one device fails, the current in the entire circuit fails, because if you have a dead bulb, now you essentially have an open switch, and now it is an incomplete circuit. Okay, now what about parallel? Well, parallel is a very different type of circuit. The voltage is the same across each, um, each device, okay? So, you know, before the, vo the voltage drop was, you know, was going to be... Um, is going to be proportional to the resistance in each device, but now, now we have that the voltage, draws ha the voltage draws has to be the same because each one creates a complete circuit, and so each one then has to get back to zero. The total, the total current in the circuit divides among the parallel branches. The amount of current in each branch is inversely proportional to the resistance of the branch. So now, the, we have to, the, now it's the current that sums up. Before, we summed up the voltages. Remember, we summed up all the voltages. Now we're summing up all the current in the parallel case. So it'd be like I plus I plus I equals the current that comes out of the battery. So it's a different summation with very different consequences. The, ter to the total current in the circuit equals the sum of the current, so I said that. Okay, so as the number of parallel branches increase, the overall resistance is actually decreased. Whereas before with the series circuit, the more, the more resistors, the greater the resistance. Here, the more resistors, the less resistance. Because that makes sense, because you're actually, the more resistors you add, that means the more junctions you add. And the more junctions you add, the more paths the current has to take, which means actually the easier it is to go to get from one terminal of the battery back to the other, because there's more options. All right, kind of on a, a qualitative level. All right, a break in one path does not interrupt the overall circuit. So the one advantage of the parallel circuit is that now you have, you know, a relationship where you can keep the, keep the circuit going even though one part of it broke. All right, so when two, two identical lamps in a circuit are connected in parallel, the total resistance is what? If you're paying attention, you know the answer. It's reduced. It's less. All right. All right. So consider a lamp powered by a battery. The char charge flows, that's the best answer here, out of the battery into the lamp from the negative terminal to the positive terminal with a slight time delay after closing the switch through both the battery and the lamp, right? Where does the charge flow, all right? Through both. It's a continuous circuit. The battery is part of the circuit. Batteries have an internal resistance. Sometimes you need to take that into account. Sometimes you can ignore it, all right? So parallel circuits and overloading. Well, homes are wired with parallel circuits, which makes sense because otherwise, if it was a series circuit and one thing broke, then the whole home was shut down. That's not the case. You can blow a single breaker, right? So homes are wired in parallel. As more and more devices are connected to a circuit, more and more current moves through the wires. There's an the amount of current each device can carry before it overheats. When the current is ex excessive, the overheating can result in a fire. All right? And that's, you know, well, more likely a circuit will blow before it, you know, because it te detects that high current. And that, that is kind of the downside of parallel circuits, is the more and more things you attach to them, the current goes up and up and up, and it becomes unsustainable because you have too much current, then there's too much potential for things to heat up too quickly. All right. Also, the addition of, addition of excess devices in a parallel circuit increases the amount of current, yep, as I said, producing an overload and overheating the system. All right. So that's why we have safety fuses, right, are wires that, um, that melt um, when the given current is exceeded, and they're connected in series along the supply line to prevent overloading in circuits. Okay. All right. 
So there we have our introduce, introduction to circuits. So big ideas here, Ohm's law, and probably the difference between series and parallel circuits, I think is a big, the big takeaways. Um, also that power relationship, the fact that in, in a circuit, or in a circuit, power is equal to voltage times current. All right, so those, those are the things you'd be focusing on, taking away, um, but you know, hopefully all the, all the content fits nicely together. Thank you so much for watching this video.